by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. In my case, this is the Camaragal people of the Eora Nation. Um, we'd also like to pay our respects to Wales past, present, and extend that to any First Nations people on the call today. We'd also like to acknowledge the Tangata Whenua, uh, the people of the land of Aotearoa, New Zealand, where uh, Neil is located today. We have our amazing caption people here today on the call, which is AI Media, that we do the live caption for us. And this session is going to be recorded and put on the Entopia YouTube channel. So if you're not watching this live, you'll be watching it there in the future. Uh, today's session is called AI and Accessibility, which we made up. Neil have, and I have no idea what we're talking about here. My name's Russ, and I'm going to be interrogating Neil, um, our special guest, about his life in digital technologies um, and the impact of AI on his world currently. And then I'll just run through some other AIs out there. Now, if you've got any questions, just shove them into the QA area, and Neil and I will attempt to answer them if we feel like it. If they're scary questions that we don't have an answer for, we're just going to run away and maybe go to the pub. Um, but before I begin interrogations, Neil, um, what about a quick introduction? Hi, I'm Neil. I am a colleague of Ross's at Intopia. I work on our strategy work inside the organization. And I'm also a totally blind person, have been all my life. And yeah, that's my two hats I wear today. Cool. Okay, so let's go back to a time when you were a kid. Um, now for people on the call, it may be a shock, but you and I were born before the web even began, um, just after the invention of fire. Uh, so uh, tell us a bit about that time, like going to school, how did you sort of absorb information when there was limited technology? Well, obviously, tablets handed down from on high um, was was the the main way. Um, no, the uh, real way that that happened was my school material was either on audio tape cassette, audio tape cassette. Remember those? Oh, fantastic! You used to have great funs unraveling them and then trying to wind them back in with a pencil, and then complain I that I times. couldn't I couldn't read my books because they they'd become tangled up. Um, but that's by oh that's by the by that's um, and also of course Braille, which is a, a, a hugely important um, medium for reading for blind people, and that remains the case today. Um, my work was produced by me on a manual typewriter, an old beat up manual typewriter. And uh, I would do my notes in Braille again, usually on a old style Perkins Brailler, which were great big metal devices built like a tank and could take out the kneecaps of anybody who got too close. So when did screen readers sort of rear their first ugly heads in your world? Uh, I would say in my world in the 1980s, um, they'd been around prior to then for such things as uh, terminal uh, emulation systems. Uh, so people who worked on on those old ICL and IBM systems in the uh, in the 70s certainly um, had access to very what we would call today rudimentary screen readers and even um, electronic braille devices, but they really took off in the consumer market, if you like, and in the education market. In the early 80s, with the advent of both the PC and the Apple Macintosh, particularly the Macintosh 2E, and that led to a plethora of screen readers coming out um, for the 2E system, but also on, on the um, other side of the of the uh, of the divide, if you like, um, for CPM and MS DOS devices, and in those days there were probably upwards of six, seven, eight screen readers vying for for our attention. Some of which didn't survive, not surprisingly. <laughs> well, let's jump ahead then to the ninety. So ninety, arguably ninety three. You know, who knows exactly when the web was born. Um, so in that world, what, what sort of screen it is around at that time that you were dealing with? So we were hybrid in that uh, particular time between uh, 
um, for the most part, MS-DOS and the very, very early versions of Windows screen readers. And there was one screen reader for the Mac, and it wasn't one that was made by Apple. Apple did not have a screen reader of its own at that time. VoiceOver came later, much, much later. Um, the screen reader of choice for a Mac user was uh, called Outspoken, and there was a version for Mac and a version for Windows. Also, there was um, a program called Slimware Window Bridge, which was one of the very, very first Windows screen readers, and then JAWS for Windows, which everyone knows who works in the, uh, in the business, um, came out in about 1995, but it was by no means the first. There were several before. Uh, I mentioned Window Bridge. There was one called ProTalk. There was one called uh, WinVision, uh, many of which of, of these had actually graduated from originally being DOS-based screen readers uh, in the 1980s. Some of those just roll off the tongue, don't they? That mm. bridge one, that's just, you know, like a marketer's dream to, um, yeah. to promote. And it literally was, Russ. It, it was a screen reader that ran simultaneously in DOS and Windows. No wow. other screen reader did that. Um, so it was a it was a unique point of difference, but it also made it incredibly unstable. Um, <laughs> and um, so it, it, often it would bring your entire system clattering down. Oh, we loved it. When you said oh, I worked on both, I immediately thought you meant at once. You had two systems talking to you, but that just shows where my weird brain's going. <laughs> um, talk then about OCR, because that was this thing that came out early on and was heavily embraced by the blind community, wasn't it? Yeah, optical character recognition, whereby you take a piece of paper or a document or a book and you scan it, and the, uh, um, the scanned image is then... Uh, decoded effectively, the text is sucked out of it and turned into readable text. That was something which really, really turned a lot of us on to the prospects of what a computer could actually do, because for the first time, there was a not yet cheap, but certainly more affordable uh, reading machine on the market effectively. And the one big thing that we all were missing out on was a way of reading print documents. So having OCR meant that you could uh, use your computer to um, read a newspaper, read a letter, uh, read a work document, whatever it happened to be. Uh, and with, with, with mixed success, because yeah. the, the, the levels of the, and, and the quality of the, of the scans were very mixed and the quality of the um, decisions that the software would make, um, because it was basically taking uh, an image and trying to work out which bits of that image were text and which bits were not, trying to organize that into such a way that would make sense to a, a person who couldn't see the image and deal with such complex things as tables and columns and um, things where there was text in the middle of an image and all that sort of lovely stuff. Um, wow. So yeah, it was, it, was, it was a big ask, but it managed it reasonably well for the time, I look back on some of the scans today, and I still have some of those files. And oh, really? um, yeah, yeah, because I I hoard everything. I'm terrible, um, and uh, they they make for very very interesting reading. And we were able to those of us who were geeks, we were able to predict what kind of error the system would be likely to make if the if it thought if 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 the image was too dark or too light or um, was like a third or fourth generation photocopy, that sort of thing. There were regular errors that it would make that you could just basically substitute um, uh, the the uh, the letters one for the other and and get a reasonable scan at the end of it. Yeah, that's amazing. We haven't talked yet about Braille devices. So you're a big uh, a combo. You like to use screen readers and Braille. Yeah. What were some of the early Braille devices and then how did they progress around this time? We're still talking in the sort of 90s, very early 2000s at the moment. Yeah, so uh, Braille devices have been around for nearly 50 years now oh to, wow. to any, any uh, uh, you know, in a sense that you would recognize them now. Um, some of the earlier ones were standalone devices, then they were able to be hooked up to a computer, usually a 
uh, uh, for example, an, an MS-DOS computer that would um, have software specifically built for that Braille device and it would um, tell the Braille device what to display when it saw that, very much like a screen reader does today. Mm. Um, but in those days, it was direct software between the Braille device and, and the operating system that was just a piece of software stuck between that was independent of any of the screen readers we were using. And, um, and that could cause a bit of fun. Um, <laughs> and, um, and by the mid to late 80s, probably a little bit earlier than that, um, we were settled in the format of what was called piezoelectric cells. And they were the cells that were used um, uh, uh, by the uh, devices that basically told, uh, that basically organized the pins in the cells to appear in the, uh, in the way that they had to, to, uh, to produce a, a braille character. And those cells were, 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 were very quick. Um, they refreshed very quickly. And nothing really replaced them. In fact, they're still very much state, mm. of, uh, state of the art. They're starting to be challenged now, 40 years on. It <laughs> took that long. Um, but yeah, Braille displays were and still are uh, of different lengths. Yeah. So um, I know we've talked before about how <laughs> 80, <laughs> 80 cell about Braille display, yeah, you needed a bus to get from one end to the other. Um, but if you were a programmer, and there were a lot of blind programmers around at, uh, at that time, um, if you were a programmer, you needed 80 cells to be able to um, fully um, interact with your coding, because otherwise you were having to split your focus between more than, in, more than one line. Yeah. Um, most of us probably had a, a screen length that was, or a, a braille length that was 40 cells. Um, but that does mean that typically you often have to split your line, um, uh, sp split the line yeah. on the text uh, be between two lines of braille. So a lot of scrolling involved. Yeah. And these days, the ones that I see most often, especially the little portal ones that kids use in schools, are like 20 mm. cell. So they're yeah. tiny and they're yeah. very light in comparison, aren't they? Yeah, they, 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 uh, most Braille devices nowadays are much lighter than they used to be. Um, they can usually be powered by USB um, or um, or work directly on Bluetooth with a rechargeable batteries. battery. They used to be these great big, again, devices built like a tank yeah. that, um, uh, that your keyboard would sit on top of and there would still be plenty of room to, you know, put your cup of tea on there or something. No, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> but but so that they, were, they were huge. They would take up, uh, e even the smaller ones would take up a big part of your desk and they would, um, then they morphed into a sort of a hybrid between uh, devices that would read the computer screen and devices that were used to take notes in the classroom or uh, in, in, in the meeting at work or, or whatever. And yeah, mm. 20 cells became very common. You could even get 14 cell displays today. Oh, that. That yeah, they're, they're cool. very good for mobile phones, not, much, <laughs> not for much else. So for those people that are trying to imagine this, imagine a flat device like a, a keyboard, but attached across the top or a series of, as Neil was saying, like a series of cells and each cell can contain six pins, am I right? Um, six, eight, usually. Eight, it's six, six, okay. but depend, depends on the model, but yeah, six okay. minimum, but probably... And, I'm sorry, keep going. <laughs> yeah, probably eight in many cases, because yeah. computer braille needed eight, eight dots. Right. And, and the user, they just will run their hands across these pins, and then they can use the thumb button to refresh, which is why yeah. they're often called refreshable braille devices. That's right. So what about... One thing I'm always fascinated about is every blind person I've met works in different ways. So a lot of people just use a screen reader. Some mm. people just use a Braille device. Some people use a combination, especially people who've got hearing loss. But you always use both, which yeah. I find interesting. So do you want to run us through why you use both all the time? Because uh, screen readers, nowadays, screen readers drive a Braille display. So a Braille display without a screen reader is a a box that doesn't do anything for, for, for the most part. Um, so the, the add-on of, of a braille display to synthesize speech is good for, for people like me because we wanna know how, um, 
very quickly, we, we want to get an idea of formatting, of spelling. Um, some of us just find taking in information easier if we're reading it rather than hearing it. Um, I'm not making a judgment that that's the right way or the wrong way. It's just how some of us work. Yeah. And um, therefore, it, it's, it's and, and certainly if I'm in a situation where I'm presenting um, in a meeting or at a, or at a conference or at a webinar, um, I can't have speech talking in my ear while I'm doing that. Some people yeah. can do that. I can't. And, yeah, my friend Andrew does that all the time. Yeah, it freaks yeah. me out. Yeah, yeah. I, can't, you, I can't do that. Having said that, you said something that blew me away before we, for anyone, we are going to move off this topic in a second. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> one thing that hit me, which blew me away, was you can actually split braille into two like on a one line have two documents that was wild I mean, you can right? you can with the new version of jaws and therefore i'm yeah. sure that other screen readers will not be far behind so yeah so you 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 could definitely have a a, a situation where you have um maybe uh, the one i use it for most at the moment is because uh, it's a relatively new feature but it's a great one mm. is i'm in a document and I'm re reading a document with comments in it. And the comments uh, are usually in a different window. Um, so normally what would happen is I would have to go into the window where the comments was, read the comment, dismiss the window, go back to the text that was relevant to that comment or the text where that comment appeared. That is a lot of cognitive load going yeah. on and trying to remember what was where and all that sort of thing. Now you can literally read the two together. Um, there's a lot of scrolling involved because yeah. you can imagine 40 cells divided by two is uh, is not very much, um, but it is, uh, it, it's definitely been a great efficiency hike for me. Oh, cool. Right. Well, let's talk about something else then, because one thing that was interesting was the, bl the blind community took up way before anyone else was GPS. So we're advancing a little bit further in the future now. Do you want to talk about why it was picked up so quickly by the blind community? Yeah, and, and we had this conversation about whether GPS is an AI device or not. And who knows? Who knows? And I think one of the one of the things that I think we wanted a takeaway for people is that the goalposts keep changing as to what is the definition of AI. And Therefore, things like OCR nowadays, we wouldn't consider them to be AI, I don't think, because no. AI is all the shiny stuff that we'll talk about later. But um, in its day, it absolutely was, because it was making decisions that were, that were beyond the, the simple if-then-else uh, principle. GPS is kind of the same. Um, and the reason why we took it up as a community in a, in a very big way, albeit um, a little bit slowly at first, because it was usually housed in expensive devices that no one could afford, which is kind of the uh, experience of, um, of our lives. Um, yeah. But um, the reason was that it was an aid to um, mobility, to be able to get around and know what street you're, you're turning on to, or to know what um, nearby points of interests are, is something that we never had. Certainly I never yeah. had when I was growing up. Um, being able to, you know, for, for people who are sighted, they can just look around and know that they're coming up to the, um, the, the, the nearest uh, coffee shop and um, and they know they're going to be on such and such a street and that and, and that sort of thing. We knew that by memorizing routes. But if you're visiting a place for the first time, for example, or you just can't remember what's um, what's next door to uh, to the coffee shop, then having something like a GPS system that that works out where you are tells you what's nearby and even tells you how to get from where you are to where you want to be yeah. was a real, real boon for, for blind people who were on the move. So we got quite used to being told off that we were going the wrong way. <laughs> the way that you guys are imagine cars. if you had a service dog that you didn't quite trust, you could actually be going, hey, you're wrong. This is the actual way. You I'm sure that happens out. all the time. I'm sure that happens all the time. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Let's talk about, I always get this pronunciation wrong. Ira? Yes, Ira? well done. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay, Ira and Be My Eyes. So uh, talk about them both. And we'll, we'll go into much more detail about Be My Eyes. But Ira sort of gets a bad rap, and it doesn't get the, the oomph that um, Be My Eyes gets. In the community, it's highly, highly popular um, because um, let's, let's just, again, trace a little bit. So um, we 
once mobile phones in particular uh, became uh, something that, that reached a high level of critical mass in terms of usage by the by the blind community, um, we found that uh, it was possible to to use them in ways that no one had ever thought. And one of them was, help, I'm lost, where am I? Um, or I need to get from A to B, can you literally talk me through it? Um, mm. And that person no longer had to be by your side. They could be at the other end of the, of the phone or the other end of the, of the FaceTime call, whatever it happened to be. And we were doing that with uh, friends and, and, and relatives and, yeah. and, and what have you for, for quite some time. And then eventually, uh, two, a number of organizations, but two in particular, Be My Eyes and, uh, and Ira, um, realized that this was something which actually could be scaled up. And the, what they did, Be My Eyes came first, but Ira was, was fast behind. Um, they, Be My Eyes had a system whereby they said, if you need any visual help, it doesn't matter what it is, it might be um, um, someone to tell you uh, what's in the room around you? Maybe you're in a, mm. uh, in a in a hotel room and you want a description of the hotel room. Maybe you're in a conference facility, for con conference facility, and you want to know how to get out the bloody thing, um, yeah. or, or or whatever it, whatever it might be. Maybe you just want to know what the sell by date or the use by date of um, the thing you've just taken out of the fridge is. Um, no longer did you have to wait for someone to come around and say, oh, yeah, that went out of date three weeks ago. And you'd be waiting for three weeks for someone to come and tell you. Um, now what you had was the opportunity to call up somebody um, in, through Be My Eyes um, and a volunteer, and this was all volunteer based with that company, um, would look through your camera and would be able to tell you what they could see. Now you can imagine the, the million and one uses that could get put to. Mm. What Ira did was to, was, was to follow through on that and actually professionalize it a little bit by saying that the people that the agents that, that, that they use to support people are professionally trained agents, be my eyes, wonderful as it is, is volunteers. And, and yeah. volunteers are brilliant, but sometimes they, they can, they're, they're, they're not sufficiently experienced. They're just good people, right? Yeah. And sometimes they're good people who know what, a lot about what they're doing. Sometimes they're very enthusiastic, but enthusiasm can sometimes get you into trouble. So um, Ira came around with a model that says, if you call Ira, and if you subscribe to the service, Be My Eyes is free. Ira is a subscription service. If you subscribe to the service, we guarantee you, you get a professionally trained person who not only knows um, about um, blindness, but actually knows how to describe things that make sense to a blind person. So they won't be saying, click the blue button with your, with, with your mouse. Yeah, it's amazing. Isn't it? I was just trying to find, when you log in, of course, I can't see it right now. Oh, here it goes. The amount of users, um, volunteers, the number is staggering. So they're yeah. currently using my eyes. Is, uh, my maths is terrible. Around, let's say 560,000 people that are blind. There mm. are currently 7 million volunteers. That's right. Yeah, that's um, right. How wild yeah. is that? Totally. What that doesn't tell you is how busy they all are, uh, how often they all... Um, I've never been get, caught up. Get, and I, I want my money back, even though I'm a volunteer. Because <laughs> there, there, there was a point at one time, which I think has changed now, um, but there was a point at one time when you could call a, a, a volunteer and you might be waiting for it to be answered for, you know, yeah. five minutes or or longer. And, and how of course, dare you wait for five minutes? That's well, unacceptable. It depends, depends what it is you're waiting for, of course. Yeah, true. And, and, <laughs> you want to get out of a burning building or something. That's right, yeah, which is, which is the way out, yeah. But... Um, uh, but no, it's, it's, it's a phenomenally good service and it, it built the groundwork for what was to come next. It's almost like there's a cliffhanger there. So what should <laughs> come next? Should we take a, a commercial break just to really wind yes. people up? <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about AI and um, Be My Eyes then. Yeah, so Be My Eyes uh, moved on to the next big thing. They're still doing the volunteer thing. They're still doing that and that is... Probably, I have no stats on this, and I'm sure um, th that they would have them. Um, but, but I would expect that probably 80, 90% of the transactions on Be My Eyes, uh, Be, uh, Be My Eyes are still um, 
through the volunteer system, so yeah. the, the analog system, if you like. Um, but what they came up with um, in the last uh, few months, last w w earlier this year, was a partnership with um, OpenAI, which is the, um, the company, as you know, behind ChatGPT. And that partnership has resulted in a feature within Be My AI, Be My Eyes, <laughs> Be little, which is called Be My AI, help, help, hence the, uh, um, the mix up. It's just a tab within the application now. So, yeah. um, and you go to it and um, when you go there, uh, you take a, um, a picture of whatever it is you want a picture of. And we'll talk a bit about in a minute what, what those things might be. The picture is then processed within about well, less than 30 seconds usually, and you get an in-depth description of what in the, is in that picture. Now, I'm trying to find a way to explain to you how significant this is. As a blind person, pictures are everywhere and they, they you know, they, they, they run the world. Yeah. And having any kind of knowledge as to what's in the picture, we never had that. We never, yeah. ever had that. Even if someone gave a brief description next to an image on a website, it was it was very, very high level because it had to be yeah, rudimentary. Rudimentary. Yeah. And then and then five years or so ago, Facebook and, and one or two others started getting into the business of trying to automatically um, generate descriptions of pictures. But what they but all they were more like drunken uncles, weren't they? They sort they of. The drunken uncles who who hadn't yet gone home, um, <laughs> and because and, and invariably what you'd get told was this is a picture of a person and a tree, um, yeah. and and probably and they're sometimes outside. Sometimes it wasn't either. <laughs> yeah, and you weren't sure which was which, and you weren't sure, and 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 it would, but it would reinforce itself. It would say, um, "This is probably outside." And I'm thinking, if it's a tree, I damn well hope so. But um, mm. it, it it was it was. It wasn't very useful, if we're honest, but it was a clear indication of where things were going to go. And where, where Be My AI has come in, and others like it, but Be My AI is leading the pack right now, is that they have taken um, an, uh, a, a standard picture that you take with your, with your phone, and you can take it live, or you can load it from your camera roll, and it will then essentially do what OCR was doing 35 years ago, initially. Um, it will take the image and it will describe it, but it will describe it in a, to, with a level of detail that is blowing our minds, frankly. Yeah. And, and um, it, it, it truly is giving us um, insight into, um, into what's in the pictures in ways that I cannot imagine uh yeah. before and you know we can do some examples but yeah, the, yeah. The... Well, let's just talk about two of the because i've actually with a colleague of mine i've seen him in action and just been blown away by it. but two ones that i remember you telling were great ones about a menu and actually seeing some of your photographs in an mm -hmm. album so maybe those two stories would work so we went to um a vietnamese restaurant for dinner a few weeks ago and what a lot of blind people have done in recent years is to take their phones in with them and scan the menu with um, mm. an OCR package. And that, or we go online and get it online, which is the ideal way. Yeah. Um, but um, that's what that means, even if you get a good scan or even if you get a web page that you can read, um, is that you are de detached from the conversation that's going on around you for some time whilst you're reading yeah. the menu. I mean, to an extent, everyone is when they're reading the menu, but it's more so for us, I think. Yeah, for sure. What this did was it, uh, so we, it, I fed it a picture of the menu. It took the picture and it came back and it um, offered to read the entire menu to me, which is not what I wanted, but it, it uh, and I said, no, no, just summarize because, most blind people, if they go out for dinner with 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 friends or relatives or whatever, we just say to us, "Give us the headlines, so we know roughly what the what the headlines are." Then we'll drill deeper into the bits that we're interested in. I'm never going to be interested in salad dress. I'm just not. So <laughs> don't don't read it to me. Just don't. No so worries. you know, oh yeah. So I'm 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 I. What it will do is it will summarize 
um, what are the main headings of, of, of main categories, if you like. And then I'll say to it, because the joy of this is that you can interrogate the, the answer. So it's not mm. just that it's giving you a static response. You can then go back and ask it more detailed questions. Yeah. All right, zoom in on the pastors. What sort of pastors are they? Tell me more about those. Tell me about the ingredients. All the stuff it hadn't told me first time around because I told it not to. Now mm. it's telling me the bits I want to know. At the same restaurant, we took a, po- a photo of the um, of the the kind of the the scene around the restaurant generally, and it described where all the things that you would want to know were. So where the front door was, um, where the um, where the uh, doors to the to the bathrooms were, yeah, even amazing. which one which bathrooms were which and. One was on the left, one was on the right. Not just they are um, they are here, but also roughly in which direction you would find them. Now, mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing. It can and be yeah, bad, though, can't it? Because um, when my friend did it the other day, and uh, he pointed the picture generally in my direction, and it described the whole cafe. Yes. But in the middle, it said extremely unattractive old <laughs> man with glasses on his head, and I kept looking around, going, "Where?" It was me. I think that uh, a lot of people have got very upset when it's tried to estimate their ages. <laughs> no, no, I thought very true. You, know, you, you can't know, argue with it's, that. It's, I mean, you can't argue with AI. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of that going on. But um, the other thing was, because you mentioned the, um, the old photographs there. So yeah. I have a whole bunch of, I mean, I collect photographs, even though traditionally I can't do anything with them. It's just that, you know, it's what you do, isn't it? You've got to fill up your phone somehow. And... Um, so I've got photographs going back years because not only have I got the ones that were taken on this phone, I've also imported them from um, uh, images that we've scanned from, from going way back. I've got photographs on my phone going back to when I was a kid. Um, yeah. And I didn't take them on the phone when I was a kid, obviously. Um, but, <laughs> but, but some of the photographs, I, I spent an entire evening and probably most of the night up um about six months ago going through these photographs and um many of them were from my wedding in 2004 oh, wow. to my late wife who, who who passed away in 2016 i obviously remember the wedding i was sober for most mm. of it but <laughs> um i i remember it really well but i which meant that when I when I got those photographs dis, uh, described, two things happened. One was I was able to verify, yes, this this is what was going on as yeah. described. But also there were bits that I'd forgotten. Oh, there wow. were bits that I had forgotten, but which actually, ha- ha- having been prompted, I remembered again, um, like name. the cake cutting and that sort of thing. And and. Um, uh, oh, the, the 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 kind of uh, things that were on the wall in in, um, in in where we had the the dinner and all that sort of thing. So so many things. The kind of dress that um, that Lizette was wearing and thing, things like that. And yeah. um, you know, but the detail of that, which I probably hadn't even appreciated so yeah. much at the time, because you know, visual, right? So um, <laughs> yeah, it, it and and that was just one example. There were hundreds of photographs that. Um, Lauren and I, my partner Lauren and I now, um, sat up most of the night going wow. through our respective collections and saying, wow, listen to this. Whoa, listen to this. <laughs> That's so incredible, isn't it? it? I mean, it, it was talk about changing your life, but it really yeah. gives you access, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, was, it, was, it was genuinely liberating. And all of a sudden, um, I could... And this sounds a little bit cliched and, and a little bit cod, but it really is true. I could enjoy the um, the the uh, the contents of those photographs in a way that everybody else always does, and I never had been able to before. Yeah. And that's what AI has done for me. Yeah, no, that makes sense. You know, the worst part about that is I've often sat with people, uh, you know, restaurants who are blind, and I've tried to read menus or describe scenes. <laughs> I feel now that I've been doing a pretty shitty job. Now this has come on. I bet you haven't. I bet you've done it pretty well. I bet you've done it. Well. <laughs> I've got to up my game. Okay, let's talk about the bad then. Surely there's a downside to this. What can go wrong with this? Oh yeah, we, we are we are all going to be um, uh, under the thumb of the great overlord in in due course. It's 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 all over. That's, for that's us, in but... about six months. Society will collapse. We'll get to that later. But just, yeah, possibly or maybe. That, Maybe just after two o'clock. Who knows? But um, you know. But uh, but uh, look, there are there are 
no technology is universally good. Um, and not much technology is universally bad. There may be one or two exceptions. Um, but the downsides of, of this sort of technology, I can think of a few um, really that, that are worthy of being aware of. Yeah. And if you're aware of them, you work around those, those risks. Um, and it's all about risk mitigation and stuff and risk management. At least I think it is because that's the world I live in. Um, and uh, so one of them is the, um, the, the one which people will have heard of quite a bit where um, chat GPT just invents things um, yes. and it's not just chat GPT but but no. but any model that's ba that's based on um, not just open AI's technology but any of this technology it often just invents things things that it thinks you want to hear almost or things that it's it's expecting to be the case so it just says that it is um, mm -hmm. and I'll give you a couple of examples one on the on the kind of the photograph side and one on uh, just on, on the straight text side and how chat GPT has offended me at times. Um, <laughs> so on the photograph side, um, most of us who, who have used it for anything more than, than just a few, uh, a, few, a few goes will recognize this, which is that um, sometimes it either gets something wrong, like the situation of an object in a room. The object yeah. might be correctly identified beautifully, but it's just got it wrong as to where it is. So for example, I took a photograph of this is this this is how how sad it is with um <laughs> with this technology that you get to a point where you're photographing everything just because you can. Um, yeah, I took a not? photograph of the bathroom and um, it described in minute detail the layout of my bathroom. And it got it 95% right. The one thing it got wrong was it described that um, it said to the right of the uh, of the vanity cupboard, vanity drawers, um, uh, is a um, rubbish bin, a trash can. I just believe it may have called it. Um, and that was fine because there was a trash can adjacent to the vanity cupboard. It was on the left hand side. Wow. Now you could say, is that really important? And maybe in the in that particular context, no, it wasn't. But if it's describing something and it got everything else right in terms of the um, yeah. relationship to everything else, but it got that wrong, totally wrong. Now that might matter. For example, yeah. another occasion was we got delivery of a new toaster recently, and we asked it to give us a description of the um, the buttons on on the toaster, which it did beautifully, but it for no apparent reason flipped over the um, the defrost and the reheat button. That could have interesting effects on your yeah. toast if you get that wrong. Um, so that's that's just one example. Yeah. It's not the end of the world, but it's certainly um, you know you do wonder. So I you know when you challenge it, it says, "Oh yeah, you're quite right. It was yeah. on, on the other side." Well, well why least, did you? At least it can admit its mistake. That's the biggest thing about. Yeah, but it does yeah, it in a patronising way. It says, "You know, oh, oh, God, of course. deeply apologise and 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 uh, I will try <laughs> and do better." And you're thinking, just don't lie, right? And and maybe it was also being sarcastic like oh, I'm so sorry do you know what I think there's a lot in that I think it probably was <laughs> another example which I actually find more worrying and I and normally you can trace where um where the error comes from actually there's there's two I want to give you but this yeah. one is, is one um with this one this is about um how it just gave how AI gave flat wrong information it didn't just lie it told a right whopper um, I'm of a certain age and, um, I, um, 312, 312, that's right. Yeah. And, and I, and I, um, have a absolute love of what you guys over, over here would call soccer. We call football. And, um, one of the matches I remember watching as a, as a 10 year old kid, um, in our, in our house at home was the European Cup final between Leeds and Bayern Munich. You don't, I'm not going to ask you to remember this. No. There will not be tests <laughs> at the end. Um, I asked it because it's a particularly seminal game in the history of, of, of the sport. I asked it, I asked ChatGPT to give me a description of the match. And 
I kn- I remember this match in great detail, so I would know if it was giving me a good description or no. not. Not only did it do well, first of all, it did really well for the first hour. It <laughs> described it. The match is an hour and a half. It for the first two thirds of the game, beautiful description. I actually do remember a lot of what it talked about. However, it went to custard when it finally said that the game ended. Um, in, in a 1 0 win to buy Munich. Well, actually, it ended in a 2 0 win to buy Munich. Um, and it got the scorers wrong, too. Mm-hmm. And, and normally you would say, okay, there will be a reason for that. And presumably there's some source on the internet which just yeah. incorrectly um, wrote down the, the, the score and the scorers, and it's never been corrected. And some, for whatever reason, Chat GPT decided that, that, that this yeah. was um, the authoritative source that it was going to quote to me. But it was wrong. It was, it was wrong, 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 wrong. And imagine that on a more serious yeah. level. Um, you know, uh, if, if you wanted to uh, find out something really important yeah. and it just took a random source that was wrong. That is a, a, a concern that I think we need to be very much on top of when it comes to AI. And when access yeah. to information for people who are blind or print disabled or whatever is such an important thing and has always been such a challenge, um, when you finally have it, but it lies to you, that's... Yeah. That's that. That's an issue that we should at least be conscious of. No, fair enough. As you're talking, I'm just wondering whether ChatGDP actually entered a different timeline, and they were actually <laughs> also right, but you know, just in different time space. Let's move on. I want to ask you about two other things. One is Microsoft seeing AI. Yeah. It's like it doesn't get the like it's it's like the poor cousin, even though it could overtake them all. Everyone's obsessed with be my eyes at the moment. So, what, what's this other one going? What's it doing? Well. Um, Microsoft seeing AI has actually been around for five years now, six years now. So yeah, 2017, it came out. Um, And what that does, it's a bit of a Swiss army knife for image recognition. Uh, And it it runs on your phone, on your, your, I think only on iOS phones. Sorry, Android guys. Um, And it will allow you to uh, read in real time text that it sees, a little bit like the camera app already can do. Um, if you run the camera app, it's capable of doing that. But this does it in a little bit more of, a, of an organized way. Wow. Um, brilliant for scanning things like um, something you've just taken out of the freezer or uh, quickly scanning your your post, if you know, anyone ever gets posts anymore. Um, <laughs> But you know, any, anything like that that you quickly want to scan, it's totally destructible stuff. You don't want to keep it. Um, yeah. Great for that. It also has the ability to um, do uh, things like scanning a document more um, in more detail, uh, a little mm-hmm. bit like the OCR packages did that we talked about. And um, also, it, it has a number of other other features that that in my view, make it the the Swiss army knife of uh, recognition apps. One of the things it does and has done for a while as a beta is to describe the scene around you. When you take a photograph, it will describe the scene around you, which is pretty much what Be My AI is doing right now. Mm. Um, But it has only done that at a very rudimentary high level but it was still better than anything else was doing for quite some time. It has now brought out a version of that, which is comparable to Be My AI. I would still say that Be My Mm. AI is ahead, but it's Microsoft. So they've got the, if they've got the will, they have the resource to catch up and, um, you know, and and make a really interesting uh, competitive race out of this, which can only be good for us, I think. Yeah. Cool. Okay, the last one I want to talk to you about before we do a, a jump off to an area is Eleven Labs. Now we go off on a bit of a tangent here, but you were mm. telling me about it this morning, and I've forgotten it all. So <laughs> tell me again. No, I have to assume that I haven't forgotten it all. Um, <laughs> no, Eleven Labs is um, those of us who are uh, screen reader users, or those of us who use um, synthesized voices for any reason whatsoever. And believe me, that's a lot of people. 
if you phone a help desk, the chances are the first thing you get you come across is a synthesized voice telling you, you know, press one for help, press two for frustration, press three for I don't want to a never ending do this. Of life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that will almost certainly nowadays be done through um, some kind of uh, of of um, voice synthesizer. So it's not just our screen reader users that, uh, that that use synthesizers, but we've been using them for a long, long time. And um, they traditionally were very robotic. Um, you know, there was always the joke, oh, it sounds like you're listening to a Dalek and all that sort of thing. Mm. Um, but you could get really, really um, high throughput with them because um, yeah. They always pronounce things the same way and, and they didn't break up at high speeds. Now, what has happened over the last few years is that there's been a, um, a, a rather rapid evolution in voice um, technology so that um, synthesized speech is no longer robotic. It's gone through many, many iterations um, human concatenated um, voices where they literally used to take some poor soul and lock them in a room for a day and <laughs> make them repeat things over and over again so that they could then be sampled and turned into a into a synthesizer and then obviously there was there was some kind of um, of recovery program for the poor souls that, that actually yes. had to go through that but um, <laughs> that and, and and they were kind of the next step um, and, and they've things have been improving rapidly over the past 10 years or so, um, particularly if you have online based uh, synthesizers. Now, where 11 Labs and one or two others have come in is um, you can now uh, effectively create your own synthesizer. And you can do that by um, either uh, uploading a sample of your own voice um, or a and this is a scary bit, perhaps um, somebody else's voice, um, <laughs> and um, and it will then work on that. Use the AI uh, algorithms that it has to to create a synthesizer. That if you throw any text at it, and currently that's really where where it where it's used most. You just um, maybe type text into a very very large um, te uh, text box on the, on the website. It will. Um, it will read that back to you in the voice that you've chosen. But better than that, it can work out from the text that, that you've given it, whether it needs to be emotional, whether it needs to be male or female, um, or all sorts of things like that. So um, my partner, Lauren, threw um, an epi um, a, a rather lengthy extract from, I think it was Pride and Prejudice, at it. And it came back with beautifully sounding speech. Wow. That was that that also had um, different voices for different characters, and which um, had emotion built into it. So if somebody was getting upset or angry or excited, that was represented. Whereas with robotic synths, you'd never get that. That's amazing. Imagine having read out in Elizabeth Bennett's voice or Darcy's voice. Yeah. Only. That's I, I, I know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's amazing. Thanks for that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to run through some other technologies just to wrap this up and then yes. we'll go to some questions, if that's okay. Cool. So you've done a lot of talking, so I'm going to give you a break if you need to. <sighs> so to close this session out, here's a bunch of other things that you may or may not be aware of. The first one is uh, speech to text AI. And there, some of you may be familiar with things like uh, otter.ai, I want some of them. And basically these tools transcribe text, uh, in, uh, speech into text, sorry. Uh, and they can free you up so that you can uh, don't have to type. They're great for people with physical impairments. And they can also do things like reduce the risk of repetitive strain injury and things like that. Um, so they're really uh, useful. It's also useful for people with hearing impairments or learning difficulties. Uh, so they can get live transcript services going on. That's one. Another one you may have heard of is ProtoSound. Now this is a sound recognition tool and these tools allow people to customize their sound for recognition models and basically um, it's great for people who are deaf and hard of hearing and you can do things like teach these tools to understand things like sirens fire alarms babies crying etc so really interesting stuff there and then we've got the one we're all familiar with you know large language large language models such as chat gdp and I'm sure all of us are familiar with, but basically the amazing tools allows you 
to summarize content and compose information, really valuable for lots of people with different disabilities. Some of you may not have heard of other ones like Tat PDF, and you could literally just drag and drop a PDF or multiple PDFs, and it will summarize them, you know, provide lists of questions, lots of other things as well. And as I said, these are great for all sorts of people, but especially people with cognitive issues, motor issues, etc. Uh, now, someone, I, I've got dyslexia, so I love this tool, and I would rather just communicate with chat TTP than humans, um, <laughs> and yes, every email I've ever sent since it began, it's been written by chat GDP. There I go. Um, but there are other things as well. Some of you may have heard of things like Midjourney. So Midjourney is an AI-powered image generator, and the question would be like, why would that help people with disabilities? Well, if you have no vision, you can use it to generate images, but also diagrams. Uh, so it's quite useful in that way. It can be useful for people who want to create images, but image generation software is inaccessible. And it could also be used for this other group of people, which are aphantasia. I always get that wrong. It always sounds like a Disney princess, but it's people who don't have the ability to um, store pictures in their brain. So I came across this amazing quote from someone. It says, as a person who deals with aphantasia from birth, I find AI image generation tools like Midjourney to be super useful as I cannot consciously form images in my mind. So that's pretty cool. Let's jump off somewhere else. Uh, GitHub Copilot. Now this is a, an amazing tool for developers and it allows you to provide sort of code suggestions and autocompletes. Now it's great for any of us, but particularly people who have sort of motor issues uh, where typing long strings of information can either be laborious or, or almost not possible. Now, there's a guy who's written a great article about it, and Andrew's going to shove it into chat for you all. And I'm going to have a dyslexia is not going to be my friend here, but his name is, are you ready? And Anton Merhorodenko, I probably butchered that. And here's a great article called uh, Realizing Potential with AI. And as someone with cerebral palsy, um, he talks about how these tools have helped him. Um, but there's another area we can talk about, which is Intel has been working on uh, assistive context aware toolkit, ACAT. Uh, it's an open source platform. And this has got a very different audience base. So it's actually helping people with motor issues communicate with each other more effectively. And it uses things like uh, keyboard simulations, voice predictions, voice synthesization. Well, all this stuff is driven by AI at its core. But probably the wildest one out there um, is this thing called Brain to Computer Interface, BCI. And basically, the theory is it allows you to have direct communication between the brain and the computers. Now, it's really, we're talking about uh, Professor X sort of stuff going on here. But this is incredibly useful for people with limited or no movement at all. Now, these are just a few. I'm sure in chat, people have shared lots of other ones that are amazing. Um, but what they can do is, as we saw with some of the stuff Neil's talked about, they empower people, they can provide um, support independence, but we've got to be careful because they're often biased, ableist, and as uh, Neil was saying, they make mistakes. Now, there's a couple of articles uh, Andrew will drop in a chat because you could spend the whole you know, hour just talking about you know, things to be aware of, but there's a great YouTube called Opportunities and Challenges of AI for Accessibility by Cynthia Bennett and Shari Trewin. Uh, that'll be in chat. Great video that covers all this. And also Jennifer Mankoff had a video recently which talked about something I'd never thought of, which is that another concern is validation and verification. So her argument is that these tech technologies are amazing, but they're often unverified. And who will do that verification? And this gets back to what Neil was talking about, like, is the rubbish bin really on the other side of it, et cetera? Um, so I'll leave you with a quote, uh, probably the best quote ever of any movie, uh, AI, like anything is we've got to be careful. And with great power comes great responsibility, as said by Ben Parker, as he died in the arms of Peter Parker. So we'd love your th uh, thoughts, maybe shove them into chat if you haven't. And Neil and I will now go and look at some of your questions. Keep in mind that, as I said before, if they're difficult, we're just going to ignore them and pretend they're going <laughs> to. Now, keep in mind, uh, dyslexia will win here. Uh, this one's for both of us, uh, Spider-Man reference, thank you, yeah. Uh, can you can it tell you how many steps it takes to go to the bathroom? <laughs> Excellent question. We love toilet uh, questions. Depends, depends how long your, your legs are, I suppose. So the answer is yes, maybe. <laughs> um, 
No. Um, well, <laughs> no, but it can tell you. Um, it can. It, there is no reason why the evolution will not be able to tell you how far away it is yeah. in time. Yeah. I don't think it can do that reliably now. But yeah. but in time, that was that is certainly something which I think would be possible. For instance, the next obvious step for me is at the moment we that we we get we we take a picture and it processes the picture. But what if you could do it in real time video? Because yeah. then cool. it gets really interesting in terms of um, constantly being updated and refreshed information. Um, cool. and Do you know what I love about this is that that you've given a serious answer. Victoria is probably a I, joke question. I, well, I love that. No, 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 no. This is, I, this is amazing. So the next one is I uh, just wonder if there are any privacy. Oh, sorry, Victoria. It wasn't a joke. <laughs> sorry. My apologies. <laughs> I'm not thinking about it. My brain there. Okay, that's it answered. Well, let's move on. Just wondering if there are any privacy security curves with using. Uh, things like ARIA and Be My Eyes. Great question. I'll leave that one to you, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, and um, there was a key one, actually, which almost drove a coach and horses through this whole wonderful experience only a few weeks ago. In September, I think it was, um, there were serious privacy concerns that OpenAI was experiencing owing to certain privacy laws in, in some jurisdictions, particularly in the US. And what they were doing as a result was, first of all, what happened um, when you took a, a picture with Be My AI, if there was a face in the picture, it would say, um, due to privacy concerns, I'm not able to describe the face, but at least it would tell oh, you there was one there, um, which was, not good, but because, you know, he, he might be looking for a particular person or something. But anyway, um, that was that was that was the start of it. The next stage, which was far more worrying in a sense, was it would refuse to process anything that had a face in it. Wow. So yeah, all of a sudden we, we were all getting photographs that were being rejected because they had a face in them, as many mm. photographs do. Uh, yeah. And all that thing I was telling about earlier about going through my old back catalog of, of photos from years gone by all of a sudden was taken away because there was yeah. hardly any of them didn't have a face in them so um and this was all because of the of of the uh, understandable privacy concerns that um open ai was having to deal with and be my ai was merely reflecting those there was no blame um uh, attached but it clearly could not continue because if it had a done yeah. that would have been the end of this project really yeah, so sure. what i don't know what they did in terms of how they worked out a solution but they have done and now we do get um uh, images back with faces on and they are described but um yeah the, that, that was a really good example of where privacy um, and accessibility can almost be seen to be uh competing with each other yeah cool wouldn't it be amazing if we went the other way and it said i can identify this is neil would yeah. you like his bank details or his social <laughs> media account well that is obviously the next stage yeah, yeah. Uh, not a question, but ChatGPT's lack of capacity to produce reference lists for their information. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. this, source, yeah. this source is my main reason I don't use ChatGPT so much. Yeah, so I'm sandwich. very interested yep. in AI. I hope Microsoft Bing. Microsoft Bing mm. uh, can, can continue with including the links to sources it referenced. Yeah, and, and, and it does. Yeah. And of course, Microsoft Bing is using ChatGPT as its um, uh, back end. But it does produce, as I understand it, it does produce referenced um, uh, information. So, yeah, it's it's, cool. it's particularly good at that. I haven't heard being mentioned since the early nineteen twenties. No, they're uh, they're, back, great. they're they're back now with a vengeance oh, because of this. They they've been they've been on. somewhat behind for a long time, but yeah. Cool, uh, Neil. If you could create an AI tool you wanted. What would it be? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I never know the answer to those questions. Um, I think I mentioned, you know, well, we did mention about five minutes ago that to me, the next step for me would be if we could do something with moving it from being uh, from based on what pictures you take to what videos you're taking in real time, because then 
imagine getting the real-time description of how to navigate a really difficult um, environment like an airport or or something like that. Excellent. I just realised the time we've got to wrap mm. up. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, everyone, for Thank attending. You. A recording of the webinar will be online on our YouTube channel. Thanks to AI Media. Um, and thanks to everyone for taking part. Have a great day.